Hey everyone, welcome to season two of Reversing Climate Change. We are doing that podcast thing now and launching a Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com slash Nori Podcasts. There are various tiers with different types of goodies available. Do you want to receive a special newsletter digest of what Nori Knots are reading that week? Be a part of a Nori book club? Get special access to Nori events? Go take a look at patreon.com slash Nori Podcast for what we're offering. And in that spirit of being lean in that startup kind of way that, you know, we like to do, this list of goodies is subject to change and we'd very much like your feedback. Is there something that you'd really like to see but it isn't listed here? Honest feedback does a lot to help us shape what we offer to you. You can send an email to podcast.nori.com or fill out our podcast survey anonymously in our newsletter, which you can find at nori.com slash subscribe. And thank you so much for listening to another season of Reversing Climate Change. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast. I'm Ross Kenyon. Today I have with me Eric Holdhouse, meteorologist, climate correspondent at The Correspondent, and author of The Future Earth, A Radical Vision for What's Possible in the Age of Warming. Eric, thank you for being here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. What inspired you to do this take on uh, climate change? Because it, it does seem, in some ways, it really illustrates the stakes of climate change, but there's also quite a lot of optimism built in here, too. It seems like you got me on both sides. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you're the target audience then, right? Tri- triangulated right in the middle. <laughs> uh, no, this book has a long backstory. Um, it originally started about five years ago as a letter to my oldest kid before he was even born. And I started it not even knowing at all what was going to happen by the time I finished. And then it's harder to have a baby than I expected. <laughs> And so that book project got sort of derailed and put on the back burner. And then I rebooted the book project as a choose your own adventure book, which is sort of like, here are the possible futures. And I sort of had an active plan of having sort of two thirds of the scenarios being disasters <laughs> um, because I figured like, you know, that's about the chances that we have, or I, that's what I thought at the moment. And that was probably roughly early 2018. Oh God, have they gotten better or uh, worse since then? But it, it's gotten better. It's gotten a lot better, I think. Yeah. And it, and it showed in my writing too, as, as I was going through the year 2018, writing that started to have the Green New Deal come into prominence and um, the school strikes and the IPCC report. And then I started thinking like, my good scenarios are already kind of way farther along than I expected them to be. Like, you know, I had some things sketched out for the late 2030s that were happening just nine months after I started this project. And then my editor came back to me and said, how about let's scrap that entire idea and focus on the good scenario, you know, the scenario where we do what we need to do. So I mentally rejected the idea of apocalypse and, and then sort of rewrote the book a third time with an idea of this is what has to happen. There's really no choice left for sort of a middle path that it's now or never, and we need to act that way. And that urgency, I think, came out in the final version. One of the things I think is strongest is definitely the visions that you're painting of the future and what kinds of changes might come about as a result of climate change. And most of them do seem to be really positive. And so you see this as a moment. We associate this most strongly with Naomi Klein, but you see climate change as a chance to sort of right the ship, as it were, and fix many of the problems that have been permanently baked into the country's foundations or the world economic structure. This is sort of the last chance or that might exist to to fix these things. Is that broadly how you see this crisis? I don't think it's a last chance at all. I think there are always chances continuously. I think every day actually is a continuous stream of choices that we're making. uh, And I think that we can create our own chances. So maybe that's the most optimistic part of the whole book is that it doesn't have to wait, that we don't have to find some perfect moment that the stars align. Just so happens this year in 2020, there's a lot of change happening. And it seems suddenly not that far-fetched to imagine 
transformation on the scale that the IPCC sort of recommends is necessary. I, I think that having a picture of what we're fighting for and not necessarily what we're fighting against changes the dynamics of the climate movement. And that's sort of the main intervention that I want to make with this book. And you're right that a lot has changed this year. There are positions that related to the prison and police abolition that were once friends of mine who were pretty deep on the left, reading Angela Davis and people like that, have suddenly become mainstream policy positions for a lot of people or nearly mm -hmm. mainstream. I don't know if you see it in the same way that climate has had this too, where um, the influence of Sunrise Movement and Greta Thunberg, those positions are seemingly more and more mainstream if they're not already. So it does seem like quite a lot of change is happening fast, and I doubt we've seen the end of it. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I see the numbers coming out of places like Data for Progress, who's kind of sole reason for existing is to put numbers on <laughs> these issues in a way that other polling firms don't, asking questions about detailed policy of the Green New Deal. How does that poll nationally? It's kind of shocking to see how quickly those ideas have also become mainstream, like 100% renewable energy, which was really kind of laughed at even just a couple of years ago in the climate movement. The idea of the wedge issue now is, is do you count nuclear power as renewable energy or not? It's not really a question of this is never going to be politically possible, so why do we even talk about it? It's become how quickly can we make it happen? You know, is it possible to have 100% renewable U.S. electrical grid in 10 years? Maybe. It seems a lot more possible than it was 18 months ago, that's for sure. So I do think that if you poll the general public that may not have a technical understanding of what that would require, it polls probably even better than it would among climate experts, which means that the climate movement is constantly being pushed and shifted from sort of democracy, from what people think is necessary to do this work the right way. I see. Yeah, that, that sort of maps with how I understand it, too. Uh, would you allow me to read your own words back to you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Maybe this will help us frame this next part of the discussion. Uh, you wrote, success on climate change where it can exist will look like democracy. To build a sustainable and just world for the next century, everyone will have to participate, especially those who have been excluded from the political process for far too long. An inclusive society is a just society in which we all listen to one another with genuine care. Where, where to start? I mean, that, that is sort of like a key nugget that I think helps understand the entire book. But thank you. Yeah. So it isn't just about climate change. You have a bunch of other quotes in there about how if we could just magically remove excess CO2 from the atmosphere and get down to an appropriate parts per million, that still wouldn't be good enough. And we wouldn't have, I don't know, what even is the right way to say it? Because there's an insensitive and bad way to say it. But if you could solve climate change without addressing any of the racial injustices or inequality, should we even consider that as a possibility? Or do you need to address them all at the same time? Yeah, no, this is a great, again, speaking from June 2020, this is sort of the question that's suddenly on everyone's minds is, is how far deep does the climate movement go? At its core, is this a movement for equality and justice? I think that case is being made pretty clearly and forcefully now in ways that may not have gotten the attention it deserved even just four weeks ago. So yeah, I, I think that the starting point from this book is that kind of an open question to the reader of what is the world that you're trying to create? Like, what is the point of what we're doing here in like a civilizational scale? Like, is it to provide a good life for everyone within planetary boundaries? I mean, I think that's kind of what I would answer that question. Too often, I think the climate movement gets caught in the goal is to reduce emissions or the goal is to advocate for renewable energy. I think those are just sort of like tertiary goals. Climate change itself is a symptom of a broader structural unjust society that I don't think climate change would have happened if we would have really lived out the values that are in, like, for example, 
in the the U.S. Declaration of Independence. <laughs> There's unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we haven't really acted that way as a country at all, <laughs> ever. And I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, like, what would have happened if we did? And we still can. Pretty much any day we can change that. So, and I know that those roots run super deep. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years of history here. But it, that, that doesn't mean, just because that's the way we did things in the past doesn't mean it has to be the way we do it in the future. And I think that having climate change be seen as a symptom of the problem rather than the problem itself, I think lends itself to a whole uh, list of solutions that are not maybe immediately thought of as climate solutions. Uh, universal access to housing and food and water and public services focused on care work rather than on upholding certain rules that were put in place to serve small groups of people with outsized amounts of power. I don't know. Um, I feel like we wrestle with details that I think if we just all took one big step back would sort of drift away. I think that we really agree on a lot more than we think we do. And that thinking of climate as a justice issue primarily makes it a lot easier to align with other justice movements and a lot easier to think about what it is we're actually trying to do. Uh, what I say in the book is that the issue is really with the, the, uh, the concept of ownership because if you if you go back, and this is kind of a new concept, it's only two or three hundred years old, the idea of private property and what ownership means. I think that before the Industrial Revolution that we were working a lot more with a general common understanding of community ownership and community property. I am definitely not an economist or a lawyer or well-versed on what happened over the last 300 years to change that. But I know that if you change the prevailing mindset of civilization, which, of course, easy to do, that we are all sort of here on a finite planet together and only through caring for each other and caring for our home will we be able to survive, which is kind of the situation we're in right now after two or 300 years of extractive consolidation of wealth into a few people's hands. We're at the point now where um, it's clear to see that was destructive for many, many people and many places. So in the book, I have this conversation with uh, Samantha Earle, who's a philosopher, talking about liminal space and specifically about the idea of ownership. So thinking of liminal space as this transitory time, you know that the future will be very different from the present. You know that you will be making a fundamental transition, but you don't know exactly what it's going to look or feel like or what you will be or what will exist at the end when you're done with that transition. All you know is that the transition is going to happen. So we are in that space right now as a civilization. Really, I think for the first time in a conscious way, we are all connected and all understand that climate change has put a time limit on this transition in that climate change itself has physically connected us in a way that collective decision-making hasn't really before on a global scale. But in the book, so I just summarize this idea of, of ownership. I'm just going to read a little bit. With ownership comes control. With control comes hierarchies of power. Those who own more can marginalize and take advantage of those who own less. The concept of ownership is connected to all of our social struggles, misogyny, racism, colonialism, and the corruption of modern democracy. And of course, the concept of ownership has directly resulted in the climate emergency, which is really a crisis of overconsumption by those who already control most of the world's resources, with dire consequences for those who own almost nothing. 
Alternatives to a world built on ownership may feel unfathomable right now, but it's what we'll need to strive for if we're going to survive the century. So with that, I mean that when we are in this sort of uncharted territory as a planet, now is the time to sort of go to the root of the problem and imagine completely orthogonal, completely divergent ideas that don't recreate the problem that we have spent the last 300 years trying to fix. And that's what I really mean. And that's what I'm trying to take a first stab at with the whole book is what could the future look like in a world where we challenge that sort of formational issue of why climate change exists in the first place. Huh. Ownership. It's an interesting locus to uh, to pin this on. There's multiple levels to think about it on, which the, the first one is just kind of obvious is institutional, which is uh, what sorts of property rights and property rules might exist. Is it something more like common pool resources like Eleanor Ostrom? Is it something like old peasant rotational rights, something from um, various indigenous traditions? But broader than just the institutional point is one about the ontological phenomenological experience of your human relationship with objects. And I suppose it would change how we viewed the world and the things that we quote unquote own if we uh, didn't see them as being owned, but us as merely being stewards of them or guarding them for our descendants or for the world at large. You're saying that it's almost more of like a spiritual change. Is, is that kind of? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah exactly. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting close to it. Yeah, yeah, you, I think you got it. And again, hopefully I'm very transparent about this in the book is that I don't know the first thing about <laughs> what should come next. I think that the job that this book does is just identifying the problem and actually doesn't even, I'm clearly not the first person to talk or think about this this way. I'm trying to just sort of assemble a group of voices that are hopefully a little a little bit coherent <laughs> in the way that I put it together about what kinds of things should we be working for um, in the climate movement and what kinds of things can happen when we do that work together, when we try to imagine a world that is still this world, but different. Yeah. Still this world, but <laughs> different. Yeah. Well, in your Twitter bio, you list yourself as an eco-socialist. So I, ma- I imagine there's some relation between the ideas that you're you're talking about here and the vision of eco-socialism, or, or are they divergent somehow? No, I think that's true. And again, I have a conversation with Greta Thunberg and with Kate Rayworth in this book, talking about what kind of system, economic or political system, could come next or or might come next. If we get through this sort of 10-year Green New Deal transition moment, and that opens us up to an opportunity to sort of put in place a a totally different governing ethics, (laughs) then what would that look like? I honestly don't know. And that was Greta's answer to me is that it just hasn't been invented yet. Like we're doing it all for the first time in this context, clearly. Like we've never had a year 2020 before. So we don't really have anything to base this on. And I think, yeah, thinking about it more of a sort of philosophical or spiritual problem, I think is closer to what it actually is. We're sort of trying to strive to figure out what we're going to be right now. And that is a very much open question. But yeah, and Kate uh, Rayworth also sort of pushed back on the idea of socialism or capitalism or any label, saying that why bring that baggage with you if you're making this sort of transitional leap to a new type of world, then why bring those labels with you? So uh, I don't know, maybe it doesn't even need a label, but maybe I should take that out of (laughs) its Twitter bio. I don't know. I think that in the Twitter bio, at least, it's mostly like a provocation that I think that to get people to ask me the exact question that you asked me. um, Oh man, I I, fell for it, huh? Yeah. (laughs) I think that what needs to happen is an ecologically focused world 
going back again to sort of the core of who we are. Like we are animals and we live on a planet with other animals and plants and other living things. And that's really what it is. You know, (laughs) I don't know, like everything that we should do should extend from that as the fundamental truth that we're all sort of part of an ecosystem. We are a part of an ecosystem. And our politics and our economics should all be sort of drawn out of that truth. I guess that's what I mean by eco-socialism is that we will not be able to survive if we're sort of in a competitive focused economic system on a finite planet. And that at the same time, I still, you know, believe in those aspirational words of the Declaration of Independence that we are all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that that is possible with the resources that we have on the planet in a way that it doesn't destroy the planet at the same time. I mean, that's a belief system. That's like a, you know, again, when we're talking about spirituality, like that's like bordering on sort of like a religious belief for me, maybe. I don't know. Because otherwise, if that wasn't true, then I don't really know what to do. (laughs) I don't have a direction for my life. If it's not possible for us all to live or to enjoy the world, and if it's not possible for us to respect all the other millions of species that we're here with at the same time, then I'm not sure what we're doing. Fair enough. I have to say, I respect that you're willing to say that you don't know things, which that that has gone out of fashion. There are a lot of things that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, myself included. I also, I really like that point that Kate Rayworth makes that those words, capitalism and socialism, do have a lot of baggage. And even myself, sometimes I can end up feeling uh, defensive or triggered if it's framed in the wrong kinds of way. Because there are things about capitalism that I do like. I like cooperation. So I think you're trying to make like a like a uh, Kropotkin mutual aid. Cooperation sure. is a stronger predictor for evolutionary history than competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a point uh, worthy of being made. Um, but there's also things I like about competition too. There's things I like about certain types of property rights that I want to be preserved. I like, I like markets too. But um, there's also really uh, interesting work that Kate does. And then also Radical Markets by Glenn Weil and Eric Posner, I really like too, which is they're thinking about how do you use markets in ways such that they uh, equilibrate in driving towards uh, egalitarian outcomes. And I'm like, oh, this is creative. This sort of breaks the right left thinking on Mm -hmm. markets in a really, really cool way. Um, And it preserves what I like about markets too. Um, So what you always wonder about things like that, does that does that mean everyone agrees and converges on it? Or does everyone find something that they hate about it and reject it? Could be either. But in any case, though, I think not talking at the level of capitalism or socialism is good because the details matter, right? There are good and bad versions probably of both of those. Actually, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but <laughs> it depends on what we mean. Yeah. And I think I would just go even more fundamental and say, like, what is the world that needs to exist and then just do it? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that it's worth really even comparing different systems. I guess in that way, it is sort of like a <laughs> a market-based system in a way where it's just like you try a bunch of things and keep doing what works and don't do what doesn't work. <laughs> I guess that is kind of what a market is. Um, yeah, like so, that's a type of competition maybe. Yeah, yeah. But then there's yeah, other types yeah. of competition where I think we could both be like, yeah, this probably isn't in humanity's best interest to compete over this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's where I think there should be and is sort of like a baseline governing document for human civilization, which is like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights or something like that. I think there are opportunities to redo those documents that include more voices other than just sort of like the Europeans that wrote them. But I think that there are very basic things that that people can agree on and then the goal of uh broader human society should be to cooperate with each other to make communities able to to carry those out at the local scale as best as we can and it's going to look super different in different places with different embedded geographies and people and traditions and so yeah what i mean what what kate Rayworth is really also 
a big fan of distributed production. So she's talking about, you know, democratizing everything, basically saying that decision-making, production, design of systems, all of that should be sort of able to be self-determined, even like a household to community level scale. That there are things that we can sort of share in common, like blueprints for 3D printed parts, (laughs) and then like let people do what they need to do with that. I love that that information. Sort of just like libraries or is a, a library is a great invention in that it's a community resource, but any individual can use it at any time. I don't know. Like we have we have a seed library here where you can check out seeds, plant them in your garden, and then like redeposit the seeds the next year when you harvest them. So I don't know. I think that there'll be opportunity for that kind of stuff. And all of that is, of course, lower carbon than having the sort of hyper globalization that we have right now. I mean, because you can see how hyper globalization breaks down when you have a pandemic or when you have a, a shock to the system in any way. And then the people who are left out during those breakdowns are the people who are marginalized in the society. So even here in Minneapolis, you have seen over the last three or four weeks a huge outpouring of the, the, these ideas uh, and groups uh, um, focused on mutual aid, people caring for neighbors, um, caring for each other. The same thing happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. I feel like that is a little bit more of a model for sort of effective government in a period of escalating chaos <laughs> and shocks. Like we're, we're going to have for the next... 30 to 50 years and probably longer climate disasters that keep getting worse, no matter what we do. Even if we stopped all emissions today, there is a roughly 50 year equilibrium period where temperatures are not going to start going back down for about 50 years or so because of the physical sequestering of carbon in the ocean that takes that long for the ocean to turn over to sort of update itself. And So that is part of what I have running in my head this entire, throughout this entire book is that things are going to keep getting worse, even though they're getting better at the same time. So you sort of have to have the long view by definition, because the work that you're doing today is not going to potentially lead to better real outcomes for a long time. In the meantime, the next few decades is going to look like all of us in crisis mode caring for each other. That's just sort of my take. (laughs) Yeah, well, there certainly is a lot there. I like that. And I, I like often when we have conservatives on the podcast, too, one of the convergent things that we all land on is sort of um, the scale of these. Uh, relationships is too big right now. And in some ways, one of the most radical things you can do is actually know your neighbors and Mm -hmm. uh, take care of them. And I think, I think that's just sort of a universal, well, grand, I live in Seattle. And so even yesterday I was walking down the hall and someone deliberately looked away. I was like, I know you, man. I know you. You're not not even going to try to look in like a little, the nod, the mark of the human, like give me a little Mm -hmm. nod. No, but I'm in the process of moving right now. I'm really trying to get to know, being neighborly and actually doing that. And one of the criticisms of the left from the left that I've always really liked is from Dorothy Day, who says um, something akin to the welfare state has meant that we have outsourced our Christian duty to take care of our neighbors to this sort of impersonal, uh, Mm -hmm. distant entity. And really, like, your duty is to do that yourself as a a work of mercy, as as she might Mm -hmm. say it. And um, mm-hmm. so I like your focus on care work. I think, and I think that it's both good for the person receiving it and the person giving it. And I think we would live in a happier, healthier place if people did that, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was also thinking this is getting a little bit off topic, maybe. I don't, maybe not. You should just um, go for it. Let's see. <laughs> uh, I think, too, you know, my last five years, like I said in the intro, has been mostly defined by me becoming a dad. And so I've been understanding, and I have both of my kids are boys. um, So I've been trying to think about what it means to be a man raising two boys in this world. And I think that honestly, 
care work and sort of understanding the complexity of your relationship to the world is how everything you do in, impacts everyone else is such an essential part of masculinity in this world that the book is set in. You know, the next 30 years, if we do it right, um, it's going to be men feeling comfortable, insecure in the fact that they can care for each other and love each other in a sort of like society building kind of way. <laughs> like if you want to call it toxic masculinity or any any number of different labels for it. But I think that is such a huge part of what this whole struggle is, is, is um, feeling entitled and feeling like you are somehow above doing all of that work that everyone else has to do. Like for some reason you've purchased that right for yourself to not have to care about that kind of stuff. I feel like grow when I was growing up in a small town in Kansas and like playing on the football team, that was definitely sort of felt like what is just like, this is how you're taught how to be a man is that you're tough and like, you don't have to care for each other that you can do it yourself. And when you get into such a hyper individualized way and realize that you aren't able to do it yourself, but yet you have not developed any skills in how to ask for help or how to admit you're wrong or how to reach out and genuinely check in on your friends, be there for each other. Like that's the work that needs to be done right now. Um, and I think if men did that work more, that it would all kind of work out. <laughs> Maybe that's like too essentializing the problem too much, but I think that's a huge part of what the hurdle is right now is that, is that we need to sort of think about what our responsibility is to each other and then just go and do it. Don't wait for someone else to teach you how, like learn on your own and do it. Everyone's capable of doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. I find even when I speak with people that I might not agree with on everything, I think ugh, there's something about social media that exacerbates this a hundredfold. But if there are people that you know from um, around your neighborhood or that you see around and they have a, a persistent, even if you thought that they were upset for no reason, telling someone that they're upset for no reason doesn't seem to solve that problem ever. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For anyone who has uh, interacted with humans for a long period of time, you should should know this one, although I seemingly have to relearn it every so often. Part of it is just like getting good at listening and knowing how to, I don't know, even like interact on that level. I, I don't really connect that to my thinking on climate change, but I think part of what you're saying is that some of this non-listening kind of aggressive toxic masculine uh, attributes are linked perhaps to your views on ownership and mm. how it's sort of like a dominance mentality. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, but I think in my experience, the dominance comes primarily out of fear where you are afraid to do things that are uncomfortable. And so you just choose not to, uh, and then it snowballs and then it gets out of hand and then you end up with 300 years of, of like colonialism and slavery. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's also, yeah, I mean, to be more explicitly climate related, it is pervasive throughout the environmental movement, this kind of idea of we know what's better for you than you do. Like solar panels aren't super important if they're connected to a system that is sort of perpetuating a consumption based culture. What is that uh, called? Is that Jevons paradox where increases in efficiency actually end up creating more total consumption in the end. Yeah, so like like lighting is a perfect example where total electric use, electricity use on lighting has actually increased because you have things like cities installing LED lights everywhere where maybe they they didn't previously have the budget to do that. Now that the cost of lighting has decreased by 90% or more. Uh, same thing is probably happening with batteries right now. I mean, this in general is like the push to electrify everything is going to create a hyper consumption of all of these technologies if we don't have it attached to 
a system of ethics that prevents that from happening. Yeah, I don't want to get into the the Michael Moore movie. What's the oh, name? I, I had a feeling uh, you said something that <laughs> caught my ear for that, but we don't. Yeah, we don't have to. <laughs> uh, where where is like the point of that movie to me was. I say I don't want to get into it, and then I start talking about it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, make a point, and then you ignore it and keep going. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the, uh, the idea was that the, in, the uh, renewable energy industry is actually worse than the fossil fuel industry because you require mining and consumption to create solar panels. Like, you have to be so pure that you have to exist as, like, a pure energy being to have no footprint in the world, like, which clearly doesn't happen um yeah so there's that there's a risk of getting into that like logical trap but there are also the opposite could happen where we focus as a society on reducing actively reducing inequality like repairing the harms of the last few hundred years in a world where we have a wealth tax and distribute that income to improve standards of living for the 20 ish percent of the world who still doesn't have still still don't have access to electricity. We could do that very easily and sort of at the same time, reduce total emissions uh, potentially. So we've just re- repurposed the emissions that we currently have away from things like luxury air travel in business class um, for the weekend to things like, guaranteeing uh, universal access to housing and food and water and even internet and libraries and healthcare and all of those things that have become necessities to having a good life. I think it's possible to re- redistribute that and not have a, a net change in our emissions. And also in the process of doing that transition, we would have a world that was explicitly focused on making things better for the vast majority of people. And so I think we would sort of break that addiction to overconsumption in the process. Anyway, now I'm just sort of like throwing ideas out. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. It's totally, totally welcome. Yeah. I'm going to ignore the Michael Moore stuff and skip ahead to the other stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the points about consumption I think are interesting and I think they're, Maybe this link is less strong than I think it is, but you talk about maybe having a four day work week and a basic income. And like most of the time when I buy stuff off of Amazon, assuming it's not stuff that I could like make myself, like I can't make, make a book that I want to read. Mm-hmm. Besides stuff like that, I like doing stuff myself. I, I do a lot of um, crafting and increasingly more crafting and gardening and, and trying to like buy less stuff. And I find my enjoyment is actually increased. I don't feel deprived that I don't get instantaneous mm. satisfaction. I like becoming better at things. And you don't become better at things by buying things off of Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to do that by going out in your garage and whittling something <laughs> or using a lathe. Mm-hmm. That's, that's how you... So I don't know. I think I kind of associate that a little bit with care work, even though maybe it's self-care or just learning mm-hmm. makes you feel good. But I wish it was more common. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and of course, there's a lot of privilege baked into being able to have time to do all that stuff. Like I have a garden and... I spend, you know, maybe a half an hour to an hour a day. Um, Not even actually. Yeah, it doesn't actually take that much time. But I know that it also doesn't fulfill all of my food requirements. Oh, definitely Uh, not. Or any right now, actually, because I haven't harvested anything off of it yet. So, yeah, there are things that we've become dependent on in the world that we have. And the frank, honest truth is that's going to have to change a little bit. And that's, I think, the reality that the environmental movement shies away from when we're talking about, and especially it seems to be like a hot button issue on flying, where almost everyone gets defensive when you talk about flying, myself included, even like several years ago, I decided that I would never fly again, like on spur of the moment decision. And then I took a job based in Amsterdam. (laughs) And so... (laughs) Uh, I have had to fly a few times since I made that decision and I get very defensive even in my internal monologue about it when I talk about (laughs) like, well, I wouldn't be able to do the work if I didn't take this flight. I don't know. I think that again, the last three months of the pandemic has proven to us that we 
can live radically different lives. They've been forced on us so suddenly that they've become really damaging for a lot of people who didn't have time to prepare for it. But it is possible to have a radically different way of doing things. Like air travel is not really necessity, I don't think. I mean, obviously that a lot of people will disagree with me on that. But the fact that we have families spread all throughout the world now makes it functional necessity if you want to have a relationship with them um, in person. So there, I think there will be a transition time. Yeah, like I said, like 50 to 200 year <laughs> period of transition time where we are sort of, not only are we zero carbon, but we are rebuilding the whole purpose of our society in the zero carbon context. Like it's easy to reduce emissions to zero even but it's hard to sort of have an entire world that makes it stay that way where everyone has a good life, I think. Yeah, I think you're broadly right about air travel and you give appropriate caveats for it. Before the COVID happened, I would have to travel maybe once a month, maybe twice for, for work travel. I am happy that I no longer have to do that. I used to think that I enjoyed getting to see um, various cities uh, from around the country and around the world for work. Um, now I'm I'm happy to just stay in my little nook. I actually find travel very jarring in an airplane. So I would like the return of airships. I want zeppelins and I want um, transoceanic liners. I think I think those should have a return. <laughs> and maybe if we had more time and weren't, I know so many people are. You can't miss a day or a couple of days of work or it's really perilous. Maybe in the future, people are better taken care of and could uh, afford the time off to travel more slowly. Also, I love bike trips. I like traveling by bike a lot, too. Mm-hmm. And I wish I was more people had enough leisure time or uh, availability to do so because mm-hmm. there's a pride in that. And I don't think flying really does it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the things that happened when I was in Amsterdam last year is that, you know, they have the most, they have the densest bike trail network in the world. And I just, you know, like woke up in my hotel, rented a bike out front of the hotel and biked to the ocean and back that day. Like, (laughs) and I, I think only maybe three or four times did I actually cross a road in the sense that you cross roads all the time in the US. Like there is no real concept of a independent national bike network here where it doesn't interface with the roads at all, where there are just like random bike only trails carving through people's fields in the middle of the country. And that's the bike road that's used primarily as a bike road And it has overpasses over the highways, just as any other road system would. You just don't even have to interact with cars if you don't want to, (laughs) which is just so weird to me that you could travel halfway across the country without ever having really touched a car based infrastructure. That's possible. Like it exists right now. Like that could exist in the U S in 50 years or even in 10 years, or even like in three years, if we actually wanted it to. There's some of it already. It's not mm. all the way across the country uniformly, but uh, I just saw an article the other day. Various states have it. There's also the canal trail that goes from like DC, pretty far west, I think to like Ohio or something. But there's a whole bunch of intersecting ones. Yeah, but I wish I wish it was like that because uh, maybe more people would do it. If so, or maybe it would just be nerds like us who like getting on bikes. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I really think like you, I mean, you go to the Netherlands and there are people of literally every age and ability that are in bikes, and there are caveats to the system for people with disabilities that need um, assistance, and there is. I don't know. I feel like it was just sort of like a conscious choice the country made about 50 years ago to shift to like bike focused infrastructure. And, you know, if you had a uh, electric assist bike, there isn't really anything stopping you um, from using that as your primary mode of tra- transportation permanently in that kind of a world that where the hills don't even really matter anymore at that point. <laughs> yeah, I do think... You know, there are many things I like about having a car and I like the freedom and uh, the individualism of being able to just go somewhere on my own and not look at any schedule or to have anyone's permission. I just go. But uh, also, I think it's 
bad that every city is essentially built for cars and to not have a car means you're stuck on public transit, which often doesn't even go where you need it to go, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it's just like a giant waste of, of physical space, like 30 to 40% of cities surface area is car infrastructure, something like that. So <laughs> you can build, you can put a lot more houses and shops and parks and all that kind of stuff in there without all of that wasted space. And also here in St. Paul to connect everything again, there is a, a neighborhood called the Rondo neighborhood, which is historically black neighborhood made that way partially because of racist housing policy a hundred years ago. But then it was cut in half by building interstate 94 that they literally excavated a line right through the middle of the neighborhood cut out a canyon, built the high, highway in the canyon, and now the neighborhood does, doesn't exist anymore in any real way that <laughs> it did before. And that same pattern sort of happened all across the country where there were, there were people in neighborhoods that were considered expendable for infrastructure designed to use, you know, fossil fuels and, and quote, stimulate the economy. You know, in the 50s, you know, cars were probably one of the main economic engines of the country, you know, auto manufacturing. So you had the government helping that industry along by literally destroying people's neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah. I remember reading about Jane Jacobs fighting with Robert Moses in New York. Yeah. yeah same thing. Happening. Happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that we're better off for having the highways going through. But there. you can still tear them out. I mean, like, it's, there's nothing stopping us from tearing out the interstate highway system <laughs> and replacing it with something better. <laughs> yeah. If you want to go from Seattle to Spokane, you better get on your bike because that's, that's the future eco-socialists want, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I had to rip you yeah. a little bit. No, I, I, I think people, people should do that, though. It's, it's pretty fun. Well, uh, we should start wrapping it up. Fun as this has been. Eric, where can people buy your book and where can they follow you personally? Yeah, I do most of the social media stuff on Twitter at Eric Holthaus. And I write primarily, entirely for um, The Correspondent now, which is thecorrespondent.com. And the book is available everywhere. I've been trying to direct people to bookshop.org, which is um, a network of independent bookstores, local bookstores. So you can buy it through there and it will be filled by your local bookstore. I think in theory, that's how it's supposed to work. Cool. Links are in the show notes for all of that. Uh, thanks for being here, Eric. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Tell your friends and thank you so much for listening. 